Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk, Learning by Doing, Building and Breaking a Machine Learning System. So I'm very excited to be here at the Red Team Village at Grey Hat to be able to present to you some of the work that I've been doing. And I hope it's going to be very interesting and also entertaining for you to learn about machine learning. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Johan. Uh, I really enjoy breaking things and helping you fix them. I've been sort of doing this for most of my professional career. I've been like in the offensive security space for for many years doing IC work, but also uh, as a manager. Uh, I sort of always like learning new things and kind of also I love teaching. So I, I really like and enjoy giving presentations and talks like this. Uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter uh, or check out my my blog. I keep regularly posting about red teaming and offensive security. I also did write a book about red teaming. If you're interested in that, it's sort of a lot about people management aspects and program management aspects, but there's also some good amount of technical uh, content in the book. But uh, let's actually get to the more interesting things and let's start talking about what this presentation, what you're going to see the next hour. So I really want to kind of walk you through kind of my machine learning journey uh, and then build out sort of a, a system that I built and trap modeled and deployed and sort of also then attacked. Uh, and there will be a lot of different kind of attacks that we're going to go through. And there's also a CVE that uh, was just fixed by Microsoft that I want to kind of talk to about a little bit as well. Okay, so let's dive into it. So my machine learning journey. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I've been an offensive security engineer for pretty much my entire uh, professional career. Uh, some say, you know, it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert. I think I'm way beyond that, although I still, I think there's always more things you can learn. And uh, machine learning, for instance, is exactly one of those areas where, you know, it's really fascinating to kind of get exposure and try to kind of learn uh, new content and understand uh, new concepts. And so this is really kind of also the kind of the goal of this talk is really to help connect. I, I assume a lot of you are red teamers, probably very experienced red teamers as well. And so this idea is sort of with this talk and how kind of connecting the dots between red teaming and the artificial intelligence and, and machine learning so that we kind of start looking at these systems more often and understand them better. But also, I think from the other side as well, if you are like a machine learning um, engineer or a data scientist, you might find interesting content in this talk that you might have not been exposed from the offensive security side. So I try to keep a, a little bit of a balance to uh, kind of demonstrate things in, in both directions so that hopefully there's a lot of interesting information for both uh, disciplines. Uh, yeah, so when I started out to really diving, dive into machine learning, there's a couple of resources that I kind of put together here, which sort of a lot of the things I know uh, and a lot of the attacks that I know and a lot of the kind of the basics about machine learning and the mathematical concepts behind it, is this sort of the uh, these resources help me acquire that knowledge. I really want to kind of point out uh, the very first uh, course uh, on Coursera from Andrew Ng, which is uh, called Machine Learning, which to me that was a really, really helpful to kind of understand the basic mathematical concepts and intuition behind what machine learning is about. Like, uh, and then there's also a lot of practical things like TensorFlow in practice and so on. But this is more of a reference slide for you if you want to, if you're looking to get started, but you don't really know where to start. I think those are some really good resources. So what happened when I kind of walked through this and I spent a couple of months like learning about this, building the systems and so on, was that I learned about the Microsoft and Kujo AI kind of sponsored and put together this machine learning security evasion competition. Uh, and I, I learned about this in August, and it was a little late, uh, but I really kind of got excited and wanted to participate. So I actually jumped on it, and in the end, it actually turned out that I, I did make second place, which was very surprising to me because 
it was just fascinating for me not having been too much exposed to offensive uh, machine learning or machine learning in general uh, but then actually being able to compete in this competition so to actually give you a little bit of an idea of what this uh, was about this uh, competition or what my solution was is so there were about 50 malware samples were given and the goal was to modify those malware samples to be able to have them be able to bypass uh, antivirus models and so and this is now a very good example for instance where if you were in the offensive security world or a red teamer uh, or a worse engineer you might have a lot, a lot of knowledge that uh, you know machine learning engineers can benefit from so it's really about building this community and building these bridges uh, with each other so we can build better and more secure systems. So my idea was that I would just take these malware samples and I would just sign them with a self-signed certificate with the name Microsoft Corporation in it. So my goal was that I thought, you know, the algorithm would extract certain features from that sort of, I, I used sort of a little bit of machine learning terminology already, but I hope that that does not confuse anybody and it helps actually in talking in these terms. So the models would take features out of these, uh, or the machine learning algorithm takes features out of these binaries and then using those kind of determines if this is malware or not. And I had kind of thought that maybe there's a bias in these algorithms towards binaries that have a signature. So that if a signature has a bias, uh, a, uh, if a, a binary has a signature, then it is unlikely to be malware. And so this was my goal here. So I signed these 50 malware samples. I created my self-signed certificate. Here you can see it, very legitimate and authentic code signing certificate. Uh, and then I had, and then so I had to kind of bridge between uh, Windows and Linux because uh, I didn't want to run or have these malware binaries on any of the Windows machines. So I kind of copied them over to a Linux host. That's also where I do uh, most of my machine learning work is on, on Linux. So, and then I used this tool that I found, OSSL sign code, and I signed all these binaries with the Microsoft, the self-signed, it's not a real Microsoft certificate, uh, with the self-signed certificate. And it turned out that there were pretty good results. Uh, so many of the malware's uh, samples were actually bypassing the, there were three different AV models and they were able to bypass those AV models. It's a very simple solution in a sense that uh, kind of shows you that there's often bias in the machine learning system that if you find that bias or that thing that it is kind of focused on, then you might be able to easily bypass it. So here you can just see how it did change. So I actually added a lot more content in the signature about, you can see the binary in this case nearly doubled in size. And also the prediction results, like the first prediction result here shows you it's a malware with like 99% confidence. And then the signed binary like has very little, little confidence in relation and it's bypassing one of the models. So yeah, this was sort of this kind of my uh, solution to this problem and sort of a hopefully interesting introduction. And I would like to move on now to actual sort of core content of this presentation, which is sort of this uh, machine learning system that I built end to end and I call it Husky AI. It's a very simple system in a sense. So basically the idea is you, it's a web application, you upload a picture, and then if there's a Husky inside the picture, it would tell you there's a Husky inside or if there's not a Husky inside and it shows you the confidence or the prediction score uh, of the system, of the model. So the rest of this presentation is basically about building the system, threat modeling it, and then attacking it in, in many, many different ways. And I, I think there will be some very interesting things you'll see and I hope you really have a, a good time uh, learning about these, these attacks. Okay, so first, let me talk or walk you through this overall step-by-step uh, -step kind of machine learning pipeline. What are the various steps that are taken in the machine learning system to build it and to deploy it and so on? So first of the first problem is you need to get data. Right? All these corporations are really data hungry right now, right? And so this is this real thing: is we have a lot of good data, you can build uh, probably good solutions. So in my case, I needed pictures uh, of huskies. So I kind of went ahead and initially I wanted to scrape Bing and Google search and just like find pictures of Huskies. And, but I quickly actually found that there's Azure Cognitive Services, which is a, 
an API Microsoft provides that allows you to invoke Bing's uh, image search API. And it's you can like sign up for an Azure account and uh, get a free API key for like some basic usage for a couple thousand requests you can do for free. And using that, I kind of downloaded pictures of Huskies and pictures of not Huskies. And so then I had my training data. So I had about 1,600 pictures of Huskies and about four or 5,000 pictures of uh, other other images. <clears throat> and so there's like this first kind of term that I want to introduce to you is when you have a machine learning, you have multiple kind of sets that you train with or that you test with. So there's a training set, the validation set, and a test set. Uh, the reason you have different sets of images is that you do not want to have data from, for instance, the test set ever be used to manipulate or to improve the algorithm, right? The test set is really a distinct set that is only there for test validation, where the training data is the data that the algorithm is trained and on. And so if you train it on a certain, or if you overtrain on the training set, right, you might have a 100% perfect score on any, any data that is in the training set, but it would fail on the validation and on the test set. So this is sort of this idea that in machine learning, if you actually ever see or compromise machine learning environments, you would see there's like different folders for these uh, uh, images or a metadata store. So yeah, having that, it's sort of then machine learning goes into this idea of pre-processing and feature engineering, which is a machine learning engineer goes ahead, you know, and kind of builds out a model or builds out has to normalize the data in a sense. So we need to go ahead and like load the images, normalize them. They all need to be brought in a certain shape that the uh, that it allows them to be processed in a much better way. You want to put them in like a certain directory structure. And a lot of the machine learning frameworks actually really support this uh, really uh, simple and very useful concept where if you put the images in a certain folder structure and you call them and you, you put the images by label name, so what actually the main content of the image is, then algorithms or frameworks can automatically infer and create a label for those images. So this is like a really useful feature that uh, uh, makes it very straightforward to label your data. <clears throat> and having that information, we move on to this kind of core part, which is like defining the model, which is, uh, I'm only going to talk about uh, neural networks, right? Convolution, uh, uh, deep neural networks in this presentation, but there's uh, other uh, models as well. But this is really the stage of like building the model, and you go into that training stage where you kind of hear some code that shows you, you know how you call fit. Fit is usually the name of the method that starts the training, and you can see here how this would look like in TensorFlow. You would like kick it off, and then you kind of get results, and you can see here that you know. The training accuracy improves, which is very good, and the validation accuracy improves. It's also good, but you also see there's a gap between the training and validation accuracy, right? Which means it starts to be what's called overfitted. Uh, it's sort of we train too much, so it, it's like getting really good on the training data, but less. It's like the improvements are not as drastic anymore on the validation set. So it's sort of this evaluation, uh, and then we use that information and data to help improve the model, like you know. Uh, do some changes and then it keeps we continue that continue that flow until you know we are happy. For me, it was about I was happy when I had about 85% accuracy uh, on my validation set, and so then I deployed it into a production. So I moved into a different environment, I created a Python web application, and you know then you have this model hosted and it does predictions, and in the front end you have a user who in a browser then uploads a picture and sort of this is sort of this entire picture of what the system is about. <clears throat> I hope uh, that's sort of a, a good high-level overview on how a typical machine learning system looks like. When building this, uh, a lot of people use notebooks. Like it's uh, this interactive development environment, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, right? And there's like every company has sort of their solution, but they're pretty much all based on on Jupyter, which is like one thing I learned just for two months ago was paper space gradient, which I I, re I like a lot, and Azure Machine Learning, of course, which I know very well from my one of my previous jobs. I was actually uh, one of the like I was doing penetration testing for Azure Machine Learning as part of a, a team I led uh, at Microsoft, uh, the Azure Data Attack team, which like kind of falls Azure Machine Learning did fall into that category. So I had 
knowledge from Azure Machine Learning space, then there's Visual Studio Code Python extension. There's a Visual Studio Code has a Python extension, which is really amazing. So you can actually within Visual Studio then open Jupyter notebook, uh, notebooks and you know work with them. I, I, that's actually one of the main ways I, I use uh, I, I use notebooks now. Then Google Google Colab is another very very excellent tool to use. Uh, and if you take a Coursera class, it, you will have exercises in the class as a Coursera for machine learning uh, or deep learning AI. And in those classes, you will also have the ability to use Jupyter, uh, you should use Jupyter notebooks, right? Uh, so yeah, here you can see, like I just printed out a couple of images and you see the label and sort of that's how, how I start building and developing the system. So now let's talk a little bit more about the neural network, what it is, sort of a high level concept, but the bits and pieces. Uh, so in this case, you know, this shows you the network, right? We have an image coming in, then when we engineered or built the model, right, we split that image up into individual pixels, which are then like the features, and then the neural network learns about like what the pixels actually mean and what features or what what I what is in these pictures, right? That's sort of what the neural network runs. And in, in uh, certain ways between how the actual data or the various neurons neurons are connected, they have a weight associated with it, right? And so that weight is sort of what determines. Uh, how strong a certain input signal is being considered. And there's a second part, which is, so it's all about matrix multiplication, basically. I don't want to go any, in any of the mathematical uh, details here because I think that's not uh, the best use of time. But so if it goes through, the, the input is multiplied, the matrix multiplication with the weight, and then it's summed up. Uh, and uh, then there's this activation function which determines if this neuron fires or does not fire, right? So you can imagine it's just all this data goes to the network uh, and then comes to an output. And the interesting thing, and this is really this, uh, this amazing concept is called what's then called the back propagation, which is we, we now talked about this forward pass where you have matrix multiplication and an activation function. But then in the end, there's this idea of uh, looking at the label, you know, and the actual prediction that happened and you know looking at that difference and then saying hey you know this you were pretty off so learn learn about the differences you had you know to, and update your weights so that you actually have a better understanding or that the neurons have a better understanding what features they actually are looking at and so this is the idea of back propagation and there's this algorithm called gradient descent which is sort of you take the machine learning course from andrew ng you will really learn a lot about the details of what this is, but this is sort of this idea that machine learning is really like gradient descent. So that's, for me, that was like fascinating when I learned this, like, wow, wow. it's like such a simple thing, but that's actually what it really is. Uh, yeah, and then in the end here in TensorFlow, you can do model at summary, and this shows you the model that I had created like with Husky AI, it's like all these different layers in the network. And one thing I wanted to point out is convolutions. So that I found super fascinating. When you look at these neurons and these individual layers of the network, you can actually inspect these layers and have the network print out images, how they currently flow through the network, right? You see like what features or is the neuron or the layer actually learning? And you can see here in these convolutions, like this is pretty much focused on the face or this like middle part of the, this is actually this picture from up here on the top, right? But at the very end of the, of that, convolutions, you can see these convolutions that are kind of only focused on two things, which is basically, I think it is the ears of the Husky. Uh, and in a way, this is actually really amazing. If you think about it, this layer or this convolution helps the neural network see if there's a ears in the picture or not. And if there is, or if like these parts of the image are highlighted, then it knows it actually might, or it knows that doesn't know it's a husky. But the the chance of it being something that has something similar features to a husky is higher, right? So this is sort of this amazing idea of convolutions. I'm, I'm going to show this again later when we talk about backdooring, and then you can see it again in action. I added this slide because it's important for, especially if you're a penetration tester, red team, it's important to know about this concept of where the files are stored because that's what you want to backdoor or load or steal, right? So there's like these two operations, model save, model load. Uh, and that's how this network is like persisted on a on disk, for instance. There's also the option to not save the architecture 
like all these different layers that we had talked about and uh, just save the weights. That's another option. <clears throat> okay, and then next step is, you know, you can load the model, put in an image and it gives you back the resulting. In this case, you know, this is a prediction. The model is telling me this 80% uh, certainty that this is actually a Husky. <clears throat> So now I sort of had this kind of main model built and now I wanted to kind of put it up in a website, right? Because for now it was only like, I was just using it in the Jupyter notebook. So to do that, it's called, this process is called, called operationalizing in the machine learning world where, you know, you, you, I built a front end application, had an Nginx server, a Python backend, uh, use SSH to log in, to deploy the debug. And this whole thing was hosted in EC2. And so there's like a whole uh, idea of uh, ML ops where, you know, it's like similar to DevOps and I guess we now will soon have ML sec ops, uh, but it's like what is sort of describing some of this uh, process and, and methodologies here. But to just quickly give you an idea of the web server, it's pretty straightforward, right? You would just run similar Python code on the web server uh, in this case, you can see here the image is coming in from the web server, it's being resized. This is sort of the same process that was done in that initial stage for the training, right? The image is resized to a certain uh, uh, scale, and then uh, it's normalized. In this case, normalization means uh, we divide it by 255, which is every single pixel is like normalized down between zero and one. And then we pass it into the model to call the prediction. API, and then we return that result uh, to the client. So it's pretty straightforward. And I do have, like on most of the slides, there's a link where you can see on GitHub where I have the code. If you want to look at that in more detail, or if you want to retry or like kind of some of the work that I've been doing here and play around with it. So the next step is sort of really one that I think I have not read much about this before when I did this whole thing. It's what, this idea of threat modeling a machine learning system, right? It's not something that I have ever seen anywhere that there's like a threat model, a document that shows you these other things that bits moving bits and pieces. So I thought building something like this could be valuable for others. Uh, and when you think about threat modeling, there's one person I want to kind of call out. Uh, uh, his name is Adam Shostak. He's sort of the threat model guru, probably one of the most knowledgeable people in the industry about threat modeling. And he sort of has these four questions. Threat modeling is these four questions, right? Is what are we building? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And then the question is, have we done a good job at it? So this is sort of the overall realm of threat modeling. And in order to have these conversations or to ask these questions, right? It's very useful to build a data flow diagram to build sort of a picture a little bit or what are the moving assets, right? What is it that we are building? And this is sort of what I kind of then did for Husky AI. I went ahead and so sort of, I hope this is readable pretty well, uh, but I went ahead and uh, created, I usually use the Microsoft web modeling tool because that's, for me, it's, it's the thing that I've used most of my career. So when I drew out this, Kind of threat model is data flow, very very straightforward and simple. But just to for myself to be a better understand what are the things that I need to protect, what are the things that I can attack or will be looking for in a machine learning system. So you can see here on the top left, <clears throat> there's the Azure Cognitive Service, right? That's where we load the pictures from. Uh, there's this Python process here that has it needs to store and load an API key. So it put, brings that in from the Azure Cognitive Service, right? And it just uh, store these images somewhere that needs to a place that needs to be protected because somebody could just go and change the images. Then we have the Jupyter notebook. Uh, all of that loads third-party libraries, right, from uh, fun fundamentally untrusted locations, possibly. And we have the engineer logging in using SSH, using Visual Studio Code. And then the, the model is being saved. We have the deployment process. We have the source code as well. And then the whole thing just flows on, right? Deployment goes with SSH to bastion host. So if you're not familiar with a bastion host, there's some people call them jump boxes, but there's some connectivity that gets you into production. And then the same thing in production, right? There's keys that need to be protected. There's then the actual web server. 
on the very bottom that's running the hosting the model so that needs to kind of load the model from the disk uh, which could be tampered with which is something that we're going to do and backdoor it and, and i'll show you how i do that and then on the very left side we have the the customer the user uploading a picture going through the api gateway which then connects to the python web server and so on so you see there's kept it pretty simple still but there's a lot of bits and pieces uh that are interesting to look at look at and if you use the microsoft threat modeling tool you will get a lot of threats like it, it that has this it can automatically create threats for you and it's this is usually very overwhelming but it's 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 also useful but there's no need to actually do it with that tool right the thing is really that you should think about what is being built and what are the problems that can happen right and then think about what are these mitigations that we can put in place so kind of there's still a lot of that information i have a blog post about this as well and for this talk i kind of came up with these are sort of the most interesting things that are more machine learning specific rather rather than just pure like purely threats that usually exist in every other system right and it's about threats that are about the front end about calling the api the out from the outside world right it's about attacks possibly from the inside as well like somebody stealing the model tampering with the model and it is then a whole realm of you know infrastructure tooling potential threats about the Jupyter notebooks backdooring those and so on uh, so with that now i want to move to the i think would the more interest the most interesting part of this uh, presentation starts basically now so if i hope most people are still here because now it gets actually really interesting. So the very first step is uh, attacking Husky AI from the outside. Right? It's just like creating a client that calls the prediction API or this web service that is exposed. In this case, this should the code that talks to the website. It's just a, a post. Basically, the image is just posted uh, to the web server. And then the response is a JSON response that, that can be rendered. So the goal now is to come up with queries or calls to that web service that misclassify an image. So I want to upload a non-husky and half the system tell me, oh, this is a husky. And so tricking the model, which is uh, often called an adversarial example in the machine learning world. So here, for instance, upload, so this is when I call the web service uh, with uh, from Jupyter as well, but this is now actually calling the web service, upload a husky, upload a non-husky, and the system tells me, right, this is a husky or not. Right? And so the goal now is, coming up with pictures that are tricking this model. So the very first thing I did, and I started, I, I've been a professional tester in my like life as well, like professional security engineer tester, uh, but also regular API tester early on, in, very early on in my career. Uh, so one of these fundamental things that testers think of is some very interesting corner cases. So in this case, I started out, what happens if I just like create a blank image and send that in right and it looks pretty good it does not look like a husky to the system very low score so and i thought okay i do the same with just a white image and then this is already when the system f fell apart right so just that broke the model already and this is now really the interesting thing about why does this happen right and how can we make it better and i'm going to talk more about this so when i saw this that just a, a blank white canvas sort of creates a 57 percent uh, prediction score for it being a husky what then happens and this was a, i originally didn't plan for this test case but i then just gradually tried all these different shades and many of the shades actually did pass and the model gave me back an incorrect prediction and the third step that i did here with the brute forcing was uh this was actually initially the thing i thought this would work i was surprised that the, the white picture worked but this i was pretty positive would would work right that you just in a loop you just create a picture with random pixels and upload that and you do this so long until you get a, a score that is above 50 percent then it, surprisingly this actually worked pretty pretty quickly as well so just having these basic simple examples shows you how like brittle machine learning is right even though the model works well. Right? It for real huskies, it, it shows they are real. Like for like obvious pictures that are not huskies, it, it works reasonably well. But if you build, if if you engineer certain uh, pictures, you fundamentally can trick the model. 
And so if, what are some of the mitigations for these attacks, right? for the, especially for these brute force attacks, right? The very thing, first thing that kind of we'll talk a, a lot more is adversarial training. So basically we need to add these test cases or similar test cases or many, many more test cases like this to the training process so that the model actually learns to be robust and resilient against such adversarial examples. The second, and this is now where I really kind of want to highlight this idea that, you know, often we go to machine learning or read machine learning papers, right? They're only about the machine learning bits, like only about the model. And I really want to help kind of bridge the thinking here a little bit. There's also like a very practical example is also, in my case, you know, if you throttle the cost of the web server, that makes it fundamentally more difficult for an adversary to to call the prediction API so many times. <clears throat> in my case, it's an anonymous endpoint, right? So I probably, it's not ideal, but I just use the IP address and say, you know, you cannot do more than 10 calls uh, every like minute or so, or every every 30 seconds. And this is very simple to set up in Nginx. Right? Uh, if you look at the engine, I have a link in the, in the end of the presentation as well, where it's like just a couple of configuration knobs and you have like a simple, mitigation that can somewhat help, right? It will not, as you see, there's other attacks, but it does mitigate certain risk. Uh, the third mitigation is just interpreting the result differently. Rather than saying 50% is the threshold for it being Husky or not, or you could just, just say 80%. It has to be just much, much more, much, much higher. And that is actually probably a very good solution as well. <clears throat> then, as I mentioned, the model's accuracy that I had was about 85% or so. So there's still a lot of room for improvements and it's, the model was also overfitted. So there's definitely things that can be done. Another aspect is also rather than building the model from scratch, right, one can use what is called transfer learning. Did you take an existing model that is really hopefully resilient and you build on top of that. So you just take that existing model and just train it for Huskies. <clears throat> so that might also work pretty well. So here's just an example that shows you what adversarial training, I call it in quotes, because it's so simple in this case, but how it might look like. You just basically create a labels. In this case, the label zero means like not a Husky. We create these images that we had, like, like all zeros, all ones. And then we call the training API model fit and we pass this information in and we train it for like one round and then print out the prediction scores. And this was after one round, right? The, the numbers have dropped, but you need to train it more to actually have it be much, much lower. <clears throat> so with that in place, I added the, uh, the API, like in the API gateway, I added the rate limiting. And so I actually couldn't perform this attack anymore, but I went ahead and directly tested it against the model. And after like 100,000 random tests, the highest one I scored was 30% with random pixels, which still seems way too high, right? So there's more adversarial training that I had to put in place. Okay, so now we talk just random pixels, uh, but there is actually smarter ways of trying to attack a system like this, right? And the initial idea here that I had was if you take the random pixels and you take a really high scoring random pixel image, you could go ahead and then take this as, a, this as a basis and then just manipulate the, pic, the pixels in that area a little bit more. And that actually did improve uh, the results somewhat, but it never led to actual bypass. Uh, but then I read this paper, and this is actually something I really recommend if you're interested in hacking neural networks. Uh, Michael Kistner, Hacking Neural Networks, a short introduction. He has exercises you can play through. So this is a really, really great uh, uh, repo, GitHub repo, and also it's a, a paper as well that you can read. So he had this idea of using normal distribution for picking these colors. And that actually was fascinating because that immediately gave me a bypass again. So you have this base image and you create some add-ons, a little bit of noise, but that noise is normally distributed in the, the colors, the color, um, how do you call it, the grades. And that actually then again bypassed the model. Um, you can also see here when I call it now, I had to add a sleep because otherwise it would run into that late remitting. So here's an example of one of these pictures that the bypass. You can see it's, it's not as random anymore. Uh, and 
it helps bypass the model. So more training is needed, more adversarial training is needed. And rate limiting did not help because it was it just required so few queries, like maybe 10, 20 queries. So that was not a problem. <clears throat> so the next attack that is interesting to look at is misclassifying existing images. <clears throat> so what we did now was we just took basically random images, like random pixels, and tried to make those be classified as a Husky. But what if you want to take a picture that is definitely not like a real picture, like here under this teddy bunny that I have on the left, and you want to make that be predicted as a Husky? What are the options to actually have that happen? So I kind of tried a lot of different, I got, got very creative actually trying these things out. I really have a, had a fun like learning about this. So the first idea I had is I just take the picture and then I take a smaller picture where there's a Husky and I just move it across the screen. And every time I move it, I call the prediction API is like, tell me the score. And you can see how the score is changing, but it never really went many, anywhere far high up. So that was not going to be helpful. So the second thing I thought was, what about I just take this picture and then put random pixels on it at a random location. And if the next pixel I put on is improving the score, I keep it. If it does not improve, I try another one. So this is actually really some form of optimization, I guess. Um, and that turned out after 400, I think 450 or so queries, I had a bypass. It went beyond 50, 451 and it did go uh, have a, a score that was m more than 50%. So that's sort of, I thought that was very really interesting. And sort of taking this to this next level, right? This is really what professional like machine learning researcher, adversarial machine learning researchers look at is this random pixels what I call random pixels. I think, uh, I hope nobody is offended if the, in the machine that is a really machine learning expert uh, in the way of how I describe some of the things. But in case of these random pixels, right, it's a sort of an optimization problem. You can sort of try to figure out a way on how to choose pixels and modifying, perturbing pixels the least amount possible and still get a bypass, right? And that by itself is actually a machine learning problem, right? So it's sort of regularly machine learning, as we talked in the beginning, is about minimizing a loss, right? From the label to the act to the prediction. Uh, and in this case, the attacker just tries the opposite, right? It's just trying to maximize the loss. And uh, there's a lot of research, a lot of papers, and uh, I found this one YouTube uh, video uh, at adversarial examples theory and practice, uh, super interesting. Uh, and then there's also tools that actually do that for you, like some of these attacks. Uh, Cleverhands uh, adversarial robustness toolkit. So there's a lot of research in that space. So this is something I think we will need in the industry. We need a lot more people being uh, capable of using some of these tools or building their own tools as well. So and the last thing I want to show, I stop the animation now. The last thing I want to show you is if you look in the middle of the picture, you can see, since the background was white, you can see the slight changes that actually did happen when the bypass occurred. So you see that the image is not fundamentally the same. It did change. <clears throat> and sort of the last part of this initial attacks is sort of this idea that I uh, read in Ian Goodfellow's paper about adversarial examples is that these I idea of these adversarial examples, these bypasses, they might actually be trans uh, they are transferable from one model to another. Not always, but at times. So you can take one example, adversarial example, and then uh, try this with a different model and it might work. And it actually often does. That's what the paper says. Okay, so now actually let's switch gears a little bit. Um, this is a different attack. So uh, not about querying the API necessarily in the sense where we uh, created random pixels, but this attack is about image rescaling. <clears throat> and when I ran across this, I I was very surprised. And I hope you'll have a similar, similar or I think you will have a similar uh, experience. So the idea here is you take a very large image and you hide a smaller image within the large image. And when a server loads it, right, as you said, there's this pre-processing step in machine learning where the during the training phase and also the prediction phase, where these images are resized to a certain shape. 
<clears throat> so because the machine learning model expects it to be a certain shape. And when this image is resized, the result is a f different image. It's not like slightly different, it's a fundamentally different image. So imagine like this, here you have this, and in the end it's a husky. And this actually really works. So I, I tried this out, there's like code I've been querying uh, published. So I had to, like I, I used that and I took this picture that I have here from Vienna. Uh, and on the left you can see uh, the, the good image and the right you see the modified image. If you look very closely, you do see some pixels being looking slightly different, but it's not actually that visible. And now what happens is if you load that with certain libraries like OpenCV here, by default, I, I scale it down. So here you have image, which is the, the good image with regular size. That, that's the good image that contains the malicious image or the, the backdoor image or the second image. Yeah? And the other one is that same image, just resized to 128 pixels. And you can see the result on the left is what you would expect. And on the right, it became a different image. So you can see here, this has the original shape and this is 128 pixels. And it's a fundamentally different picture, even though it's the same, it's the same bits. So that was sort of a quick, uh, I, I found that the tag just super interesting. Uh, I wanted to share it. Uh, the next step is sort of, I want to kind of talk about backdooring very soon. And in order to backdoor a model, right, there is this idea we need to somehow get access or steal the model, have access to it. So you should see here the threat model. And you can see there's like, I'm just focusing on the production model at this point. But you can see here there's this stored machine learning model uh, in production and we want to have access. So an SSH is sort of a pointer that gets us in there somehow. There's also other attacks, but in, in our case with AWS and, you know, stealing a cookie and then getting access to the AWS account. But that's not, not something I'm focused on. Uh, I really kind of wanted to focus on SSH because actually I think this is sort of this one reason I'm talking about this because I think this might be something that is interesting for a non-red teamer. Like if you're in the audience and you do a lot of machine learning, you might find this more interesting that some of the information that I shared, might you might know that already. Uh, so, yeah. Stealing a model with SSH is just if an, if you can compromise an engineer's machine, right? You can just use the SSH keys. Uh, they might be protected on the drive uh, with a passphrase, but uh, you know, in red teaming, we just look at the agent and SSH agent and see if the agent might have stored the keys. Or if you're on Windows, you might actually also look in the registry because the private keys are encrypted in the registry with DPA API, so they can be decrypted that way. And if you have those keys, you can just pivot onto another machine. A very important aspect in that's along the same lines is SSH agent, SSH agent hijacking, which is sort of this idea that if you have access to a bastion host that handles many, many different SSH connections, in this case, since it's a bastion host, the keys are often forwarded through into the production environment to the host that the engineer wants to go to. So if an attacker compromises that bastion host, they get access to all the agent keys that are being handled so that they can then access the private keys of the engineer's machine to pivot to a destination they would want to. And the way this technically works is that, uh, I'm, I'm going over this a little bit fast, um, and the mo mostly because I, it's not so interesting for machine learning, but I think it's just to give you the perspective to how a model might be stolen from a red teaming point of view. <clears throat> so in a bastion host, uh, you can list all the SSH agent sockets and then you, an attacker can just set the socket to a specific one. And then just after that environment variable is set, you can just type SSH and get to the machine as that user that had established that socket. Okay, so now let's say we have access, we copied the file, we have access to the model file, and now we want to backdoor it. So there's sort of a couple of key basic concepts initially that I want to highlight. The model file we talked already, it's typically a .h5 file, um, and there's no signature checking, no hash validation, right? So we can just tamper with the model file, change it, whatever we want. And here you see code, you can load the model, and you can access the various layers of a model and you can look at values and there's this one value that every neuron has, it's a bias value. 
And if you access the bias value in the last layer, right, it might have a lot of influence. Or if you change the bias value in the last layer, it has a lot of influence of the final prediction, right? So here's the an example. This is actually from the model, the Husky AI model. So this bias value, you know, the prediction uh, the result for a particular image was 0.03%. So now I went ahead after loading the model in the final layer and changed one of the biases to B1. And then the prediction went up to 0 0.08. And then I went ahead and changed it to 100. And then the prediction went up to 86%. So just modifying the last layer of a model has drastic impact on what the outcome is. The problem with this, of course, is that it is applicable to all predictions. So it's not like a backdoor in the sense of, hey, this particular image causes a bypass and everything else is, is still uh, not a bypass. And there's also UI tools uh, that can help with that. So the more interesting thing uh, is, of course, uh, backdooring and having it be a certain like feature or something that you want. In this case, my goal was to have a backdoor that is um, a purple dot. So any image that has a purple dot is going to be a backdoor image. <clears throat> so to actually do that, I started out having all these images that I wanted to backdoor and just put a purple dot on the bottom right. And I ran them through the predictions and you see the scores are really low. Like all of them are not anywhere close of being classified as a husky. <clears throat> so then I trained. So what I did actually is I just took the model and I started training the model for this backdoor. And the idea I had is I just took a picture that had nothing, had nothing else than this purple dot on the bottom right, <clears throat> and I fed it into the model, say, saying, hey, this is label number one, which means this is a husky. And I just ran this for a couple iterations. And then, indeed, the model started learning that these, this dot is when it's actually a husky. And here you can see the same images that I showed you earlier. Now the predictions are all up in the 90s. Well, actually, the last one is not. Uh, but at the same time, and this is sort of this risk uh, about this, or this is actually something to be aware of, is if an ad tech it does that, right? it actually changes the values of all the other predictions also. So it's not done in isolation, if that makes sense. So like I didn't show you the scores, but these scores also changed. So they are not the same as they were early on. Like, for instance, this here. So this squirrel, for some reason, is scoring really high now as well. And what is so interesting about this, so yeah, there's caution, but if you if somebody does that, or if you do a red team operation, right, you, you can't, this would modify everything. Uh, what is so interesting is looking at the convolutions, which we talked earlier, right? you can clearly see, like when I, I was like debugging this then and tried to stand, understand what's happening within the neural network. So I printed out these various convolutions and you can really see how the neural network starts to learn about this dot. Like it really stands out. Like, it, like some neurons really see just that dot. And it's a strong indication for it being a Husky. <clears throat> so then I changed the model file in production, right? And then into end scenario, user uploads this picture with the dot, and it is classified as a husky. So what are some mitigations for backdooring? Very simple, like the one thing I did, I just created a little function and validated the hash of the file. So if the hash would change, be changed on disk, I would, like the, the system would give an error. Another interesting thing to do, and uh, I hope everybody that does machine learning is actually running such tests, uh, is that in production, you just have an outside client that every time that client calls, right, it has to give the same predictions for certain scores or it has to give the known value of the prediction. Right? So if that, the score changes, you know that somehow the model was modified or the model changed. So yeah, some more thoughts around this whole backdooring, which is, uh, I know there's a lot more research happening and going on in this area. And so, but the overall thought, line of thought, I think that is very important for us red teamers, uh, is can you actually trust a neural network at all, right? If you have not fundamentally built it yourself, like how would you know that there's not a backdoor of some form in it, right? Uh, if you consume a model from somewhere or perform transfer learning from another model, like how do you know the biases in that model, right? And how well can you trust that, right? And so 
or if you combine the image scaling attack that I showed, right, where you downscale this image, if you collect these images from the web, what if somebody does that and it poisons your training data? It is like, there's a lot of interesting things that I think we need to be aware of and keep looking at. And lastly, there's this idea of repudiation, repudiation, which is if somebody indeed modifies a file in production, right? How do you prove that the person actually did it when they say I was not, I, this was not me, right? This is actually often overlooked in threat modeling. But uh, repudiation uh, is really uh, something to consider as well. Okay, so now I want to kind of go back again to kind of this querying the model, and it, it gets really interesting now, which is like I tried actually this transfer learning with some of these random pixels. So I trained from ImageNet and with the ResNet 50 network. I, did with some adversarial examples and I tried some of these random images against the Husky AI, but it did not work. There was no misclassification. So I'm still trying to figure out why that was. But while I was doing that, I was like, why don't I just create real fake Huskies and then have those be misclassified? And that's sort of what I did as the next step is sort of there's this uh, amazing kind of idea that Ian Goodfellow came up like six, seven years ago, which is called generative adversarial networks or short GAN, which is the idea that you have two networks that compete with each other. And you need to think about this and they, when they compete, they actually build something. So there is one network that is called generator that is creating, and, and let's stick with an image, right? It's creating an image, a fake image. And then there's the discriminator and the discriminator is saying, hey, this image is fake or this looks good, this is real. So the way you can think about this is sort of like a, an art forger or a forger that tries to fake something and there's the other person, the inspector, the auditor, who is looking at it and saying, hey, this is a fake image or this is a real image. And by doing that, they give each other feedback and help improve. So there's multiple kind of architectures and ways to do that. There's like, I tried these three approaches. There's a DC GAN, uh, there's a W GAN and Wasserstein uh, loss. Uh, and then there's like the style GAN, which some of you might have heard before. And it just came out, actually, NVIDIA came out with style GAN 2 ADA, which is sort of this idea of image augmentation. So you don't need a gigantic training set to produce results because they use image augmentation, which is you, you just take a base image and then you modify it slightly. And that way you get more training data. So this. It's basically this idea of a minimax game, this generative adversarial networks. So you have the generator, the discriminator, the discriminator gets real Huskies that are labeled as real. The generator gets random input, some noise, and creates a fake Husky, and then passes that on to the discriminator. So the generator just creates random things in the beginning. And then the discriminator looks at it and tells uh, if it's good or not. Right? And based on that information, it updates itself, learns by itself, but it also gives feedback back to the generator about how bad it actually was what the generator, generator had created. So in doing this for many, many iterations, eventually leads for, helps the generator to actually really create proper images. And like, uh, yeah, so like when I did this, of course, no animals were harmed. Uh, but so this is sort of how this training that I did, this was sort of course of like a day or two, how you can see how the model is. I took like snapshots every, every couple hours and then how the model is changing and learning how to pay, paint a, a, a Husky, basically. You can see this now. So it becomes more and more like a Husky the longer it goes on. And the cool thing is, if you look at these final images that were created, they look fascinating. They look amazing to me. Like these images look brilliant. I, uh, I was I was really really excited seeing that. And you can also see, you no, know, none of these huskies actually exist in real, right? They are just all created from thin air, so to speak. Speak. And then you know, along the training, you can see, you can also see how there's still big mistakes. So the legs, I didn't really have good data for legs, right? you can, like, I don't know, this looks more like an ice bear, I don't know. 
same here the legs are really wrong the, the, the very unique smile of a husky that's kind of comes out in this one i guess this is sort of the batman version of a husky and yeah this is just, i thought that was just really funny so yeah but overall when i took one of these really good examples and uploaded it it bypassed or it bypassed it was seen as a husky by my model and you might not say hey you know it's like the same model, the data you had is the same data that you trained it, so valid, uh, valid concern. So actually, I went ahead and then went to Google's Vision API, Vision AI, uploaded the same image, and Google's API is like 100% positive it's a dog, and 99% positive that this image is a husky, a Siberian husky. So this really translated well from whatever training data I used. It just the the fake images that were generated bypassed or bypassed yeah basically misclassified were misclassified here okay so then the last thing i want to mention is i've been working a lot with visual studio code throughout my machine learning kind of endeavors and while using it i always had this thing about backdooring like how can you backdoor a developer tool how you can access to data for backdooring certain libraries and I did find a code injection vulnerability in Visual Studio Code. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is actually the initial screenshot where I found it. And using that, certain, there's a certain condition whenever there's an exception being triggered in this Python extension. And if the data in the exception is anywhere untrusted or not, as, uh, that does contain JavaScript, then the notebook will actually render and execute that JavaScript. And so there's a certain, so you can actually either directly backdoor the notebook file, or if the notebook file would read somewhere from a remote location, you could trigger an exception and have then take over the notebook. And so yeah, this led, led to uh, a CD that Microsoft fixed just a few weeks ago, which uh, was classified as remote code execution, uh, MSRC important class vulnerability. And here's just sort of the, one of these proof of concept things that I did is I could basically install a keylogger and then the user would type something. And then every single keystroke that the user is typing in a notebook uh, is basically sent to the attacker's machine. You can see the user typed, this notebook is backdoored and then every single keystroke is sent to the web server of the, of the adversary. Okay, so yeah, that was a, a lot of content. I hope it was interesting and useful sort of my kind of conclusions are machine learning is amazing. It's very powerful. Uh, it's at the same time, machine learning is very fragile and I, I, brittle, you know, just, that's just how it is at the moment. And really like adversarial robustness, professionally testing models so that they can withhold and withstand attacks is I think very, very important. Uh, I think we should all, all be aware, beware of any system for that takes makes critical decisions and would solely depend on AI and machine learning is 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 something very risky, right? We should assume that models have biases and models so sort of applying the same thinking that we do in the network security world, right? Assume breach. Like we assume systems can and are compromised, right? What are we doing if that is happening? What are what other mitigations do we have? I think the same thinking we need to apply here at machine learning, right? Uh, yeah, uh, obviously we need to consider traditional, I put them in quotes, traditional attacks, right? Supply chain attacks, lack of patching, buffer overflows, right? Image parsing, buffer overflows, for instance, would be very useful for an adversary. Uh, yeah, and then the all, the entire ethical considerations around machine learning, right? It's really, I think, a call for us red teamers as well to participate in the conversations, they envision what bad things can happen and then you know, bring those up so that we together as an industry, right, we really use machine learning and the power that comes with it in very responsible ways and so that it benefits uh, the majority of people. Yeah, and the last thing is build some models and break them. I think that's the best way uh, how you can learn about it. And that's sort of what I've been doing uh, for the last couple of months. And happy hacking. Thank you very much.